Hello, everybody, and welcome to the PC Gamer Show. My name is Tom Marks. You're not Tom Marks. Whoa, what's what going on here? Hold on. I'm James Davenport. And who are you guys? What's going on here? How's it going, James? Well, I'd be better, but I'm really confused right now. <laughs> that is confusing. Where's Tom at? Tom's on vacation. I think he's in Disneyland right now. Disneyland? He's on a ride somewhere? Well, yeah. shoot. I guess we'll have to do this with Autumn somehow. We'll see That's how fun. it goes. Luckily, I've got you guys to keep me company. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Evan, editor-in-chief of PC Gamer with James and Chris Livingston over in California. How's it going, guys? Doing good. Super. Great. Good so, to be here. XCOM 2 is a pretty big game. We're going to talk about that this week, along with the uh, renewal, I guess, of the Overwatch beta which just went live earlier this morning. So that's pretty exciting. A couple new maps. We've got some new details on Overwatch's progression system, which they say they're calling Overwatch a game that is not based on progression, whatever that means. <laughs> uh, but we're also going to be talking about the Dying Light new stuff and Firewatch, which released this week. Our review's up there as well. But other than those games, have you guys been playing or, or interested in anything else this week? Well, uh, other than Firewatch, can I not talk about Firewatch yet? Sure. Well, okay. We're going to talk about it later, but sure. Um, well, I've been playing Firewatch a bit, meaning that I finished it last night. Uh, <laughs> I played a bunch of XCOM, which we'll get to as well. Uh, and a little bit, just before I started, um, I keep wanting to call the game Yarny, but it's <laughs> definitely not called Yarny. <laughs> it's called Unravel. Uh... And I only got to play about 10 minutes of it, but it's uh, EA published, uh, side-scrolling, uh, character-based platformer where you play as a, an animated ball of string in the shape of a, a uh, humanoid, I guess, and you uh, kind of uh, wander through these environments as you come unraveled, and you use the string you leave behind you to like swing from stuff and uh, uh, solve simple platforming puzzles Oh, well, you know, they made no promises. To um, it yeah. seems like uh, a pretty sweet, clever game. Hard mm -hmm. to say at this point, but uh, I don't know. It seems at least worth checking out. I'm going to play more of that and uh, either uh, get terribly angry at its overbearing sentimentality or uh, turn into a fussy, cryy, sad memory baby by the end of it. <laughs> we'll see. I don't, you know... Yeah, there was an article yesterday on, on Kill Screen that I think I think the headline was I hate Yarny, like Yarny Burn in Hell. I think, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. And sort of digging into God, I can't even explain because I, I can't really rationalize why this guy was reacting so strongly to I mean everybody's entitled to their opinion on the internet, but uh, I don't know, it seems like a perfectly fine idea for a platformer. I, I love the whole kind of, you know shrunken down aesthetic where you're looking at things at a different scale mm -hmm. like the scale of a, of a gecko or something <laughs> uh, so yeah and I think there's some some cool mechanics associated with swinging and you know only being being able to go so far with your body because your your character is literally the substance that you're using to kind of navigate the world so yeah we'll see yeah I think the concern in that piece if you can call it concern uh <laughs> was that it was perhaps a little, I don't know, sentimental, maybe a little uh, emotionally manipulative. Um, and it's certainly like watching some of the trailers, it did seem to be setting this sort of like tone. Like I saw this this one moment where it looked like Yarny sat down and picked up a little doll of something, of some sort, and seemed very sad. And I thought, oh boy, is this really, is this gonna really tug at my heart strings? Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, I think it's fine to to go for, you know, something sweet or something emotional. Um, and also, that that piece was written. I don't think he had actually played the game yet, so it yeah. seemed like <clears throat> maybe he's got a point. Maybe Yarny should burn in hell, but I think you should probably give the game a shot first. Yeah, and I understand yeah. the. Uh, it's, it's the piece seemed a bit self aware um, and jokey, but even so. Well, the idea that anything that expresses a basic emotion in sort of a playful, whimsical way is not worthy of time or attention 
is a bit silly to me. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, that'd be like saying to hell with every Pixar movie, to hell with, you know, all of these constructed uh, emotional, simpler things um, that, you know, maybe as an adult who has stared into the abyss uh, don't have the same value, but as, you know, a child or someone nostalgic and just, you know, wants to, uh, in a very knowing way, just flirt with those feelings and have some fun and, you know, reflect in a, an easy way. It seems like a harmless, harmless way to go about it. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I haven't been playing any yarn based platforms. <laughs> I have, other than XCOM 2, I've been playing Rainbow Six Siege still, which I think I've put uh, like 160 hours into at this point since December. Um, just playing with a group of four other guys that I've been playing with since TF2 was mm -hmm. released. That's really good. Rainbow Six got its first big patch yeah. uh, last week, along with like the first set of season pass content called Black Ice. Made a huge bunch of fixes. There, there's still, I mean, like any game, there's still kind of bugs here and there. I, I killed somebody because their leg was sticking through a wall yesterday. It felt pretty weird. <laughs> yeah. But in general, it's a really good competitive shooter. I think it's it's right up there. I mean, if if you if you've been curious about Rainbow Six Siege, the way I, the way I put it is, it's a slower Counter Strike. It's a game where, like, unlike Counter Strike, you can't use your reflexes and your motor skills to get out of every problem necessarily. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, there's, there's like, there's so little aim penalty when you're, when you're strafing left or right. Um, it's, it's less of a demanding game in that regard, but it's still really enjoyable, high fidelity. I, I love outsmarting people. I love scaring people by, by making noise and explosions and blowing up the walls in yeah. that game. It's a really satisfying aspect of it. And uh, it's super replayable. I mean, they've, they have like, I guess 12 maps in there with the one that they've added since the update. Yeah. Maybe it's 11. Um, and it, it continues to have a lot of longevity. So, without Are getting something too... about bear traps. Yeah. Are there bear traps added? <laughs> Please tell me about capturing people in bear traps because it sounds <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, it's been great. Yeah. <laughs> so, one of the, they added two operators, they call them, they're, they're characters, uh, bringing the total up to 22, I believe. And, you know, half are on offense or half, half are on defense because it's an asymmetrical game. Uh, and one of the defenders that they added is called Frost. And she has these floor traps that she can put down that look like super deadly, like, uh, like a bear trap welded to a welcome mat that you put in. <laughs> it doesn't say welcome or like this humble home or Hello, something. Hello, bear. <laughs> I think I need one of those for my actual uh, home because... <laughs> We used to have this little sign up that said no, like no solicitors and stuff like that. Because since I work from home, you don't want the doorbell ringing all day. And I took it down for one day because I had cleaned the window. And like an hour after I had taken it down, the doorbell rang. <laughs> so I'm I'm gonna need one of those bear traps that looks like a welcome. That's a logical thing. step. Yeah, they're always watching. Uh, but but yeah, it's super fun. I mean, this game is like Counter Strike meets Home Alone in, in a way. Like you can you can definitely play it that way if you want to. Um, the some of the defenders have these kind of like offensive traps that they can lay. Uh, like one of them has basically laser trip wires that activate C4 that insta kill anybody. Um, but yeah, this Frost character, uh, their traps are really good, like anti window. They're like a good counter to I should say, um, because they're really hard to see when you're like busting through a barricade through a window. Um, and usually, the, like, if you're not damaged, they'll just incapacitate you, and you see the, the trap, like, bite your leg and you can, like, crawl around on the ground, you're incapacitated. Ugh. And it's, I mean, it's really fun. It, it's super satisfying to get, get a kill. Like, I've, I've ended around getting that kill. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah, it, it just sort of, I'm looking forward to seeing how that character changes the meta in this game, because the, the meta was kind of starting to stagnate and just focus on a few operators, so... Yeah, so far, so good with that game. Cool. Good to hear. Chris, I know you've been playing Dying Light, but anything else you got your eye on this week? Um, well, I've been playing uh, a bit of Firewatch last night and this morning, and also I'm still... Well, let's say I haven't finished The Witness, but I think I may be finished with The Witness. Uh, um, uh. I've sort of <laughs> run into the, the, the situation where I still kind of have a lot to do and I'm just not that interested in really doing it I think 
I've progressed as far as I'm willing to uh, to try. I think. <laughs> so I haven't loaded that game up yet. Is I mean, what is the puzzle variety like? Because all of the kind of images and video I've seen have been of these kind of line based grid puzzles and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are, I mean, that is primarily the, what you're doing, you're drawing a line through some sort of grid or pattern and trying to figure out uh, the correct way to do it. Um, there's a lot of variation between, um, you know, each kind of has its own rules. Sometimes the rules change. Um, sometimes there's uh, a combination of different rules on the same grid. Um, but yeah, it is, it is very much a uh, drawing a line, trying to determine, you know, the correct solution type of thing. Well, um, and I, I, you know, I, I have enjoyed a lot of it, uh, a great deal. Um, I just, I'm not, I'm not too bright when it comes to this stuff and I also <laughs> don't have a lot of patience. Um, so sometimes I'll, I'll get somewhere and I'll see this thing and I'll be like, I know exactly what I have to do to solve this. And I just don't want to put the time into it because it'll, hurt my brain and then I kind of tend to walk away yeah. um the sort of the it's sort of a, a a plus and a minus like sometimes in a in a game you'll hit a puzzle like in a puzzle game you'll you'll hit a puzzle and you can't go any further until you complete that puzzle that's and that to me is a good motivator because it's like well I I want to keep going so I'm just going to stay here and I'm going to do this and figure it out and the witness you know, there is a progression in several areas as you work through puzzles one at a time. But if you're stuck, you can just turn around and walk, go somewhere else on the island. And that's kind of like a double-edged sword for me. <clears throat> it's like if I have a crossword puzzle in a, in a newspaper, I'll sit there and I'll work it and work it and work it. If I have a, I once bought a book of crossword puzzles, which was a big waste of time because <laughs> as soon as I would get stuck on one, I would just turn the page and go to another puzzle. Yeah. I just didn't... If that option is available to me, I'm I'm gonna take it. So um, the witness did, kind of makes me think of that. Chris, did you end up like uh, air quotes finishing the witness, or are you? Getting... No, I didn't. I didn't even get to the the end where then you can go and keep going. I right. Finished. Um, did, did you feel at least? Because I know Jonathan Blow. He's kind of associated with his his puzzle design, but he's also associated with uh, uh, philosophical, grand philosophical underpinnings in his games. Do you feel like uh, this game reached out to you in any way or like moved you in any way uh, in that sense? Or did you glean a message of any kind from this game? Um, I, I felt like there was, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it really reached out to me. There was, there was a, a moment without being specific, because I don't want to spoil it for anyone, because it was a really great moment for me, but where I sort of realized, oh, there's sort of something else going on here. Um, and when I kind of realized that, it was really great. And I realized that a lot of the stuff I'd been seeing in the game and kind of taking note of, like, oh, that's something interesting or that that's a, you know, visually appealing or, or something unusual, I realized that these things I was seeing were actually a part of the game itself um, and that was kind of a great moment and it, it there's you know it's actually a couple different types of games in there yeah um, and one of them one of those types of games and I, I hate to be so vague but like I said I just don't want to spoil it I think we're probably gonna do a spoiler discussion on the site at some point um, but it was it was very appealing to me and it really did give me like a couple days of just sheer enjoyment uh, that the the game I had been playing hadn't really been providing to me. I feel you. I feel you. Yeah. Good to know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not. Sure. I'm still not sure if Witness is going to be my type of game. We'll get around to it eventually. I'm hoping to play it with somebody else, maybe rather than playing it alone. Maybe that'll make it a better experience. I was thinking it would be a great kind of co-op game. Um, I think it would be great to play with someone sitting beside you. Yeah. Uh, I think it would also be great to play with another person in the game with you. Um, uh, I, it probably wouldn't quite work, um, but the idea of someone else kind of running around the island with you, I think, would be sort of enjoyable. Yeah. All right, so before we talk about XCOM, I want to mention, again, the Overwatch beta has gone live again on Battle.net, and... With it, they've added a couple new maps. They've added a new King of the Hill style game called Control. 
So, you know, while we haven't been able to jump back in, it just, just happened earlier this morning. Uh, we're looking forward to getting back in there and sharing some new impressions from you guys. But we do have an article on the site right now featuring an interview with uh, the game's director, Jeff, Jeff Kaplan, at Tom, visual host. Talked to him earlier this week. And, you know, basically the lowdown, I mean, I, I guess the, one of the main takeaways is, hey, here's kind of a first look at all the new skins and emotes and sprays they have in the game now. If you remember sprays from back in the day in old yeah. source, source Engine games. Um, so basically all, you know, all the stuff that you're le- earning through these loot boxes that drop over time. And I think the, the big takeaway is other than some, like a, a couple skins, I guess, associated with pre-orders that they want to remain exclusive, you can't, you know, none of this stuff is only buyable through real world, world currency. And you can earn it over time as well through uh, just progression, getting drops. So it seems like they're, they're definitely following the TF2 system so far, or at least like the earliest form of Team Fortress 2 system, which makes sense considering Overwatch is so inspired by Team Fortress 2. Yeah. Uh, but it's worth noting like there's no crafting system in the game right now, and, and they haven't really revealed any way of, you know, any plans to do that. Um, and there's no like market system where you can just buy stuff directly. You can't buy the loot crates directly even, although Blizzard's curious about that possibility in the future. So right now it seems like a, you know, a pretty straightforward system. Uh, Blizzard emphasizes that it's not a progression-based game in the sense that you're not grinding to get stuff. Again, all the stuff is cosmetic right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, do you guys think that we'll see... Well, yeah, the one, main thing I'm curious about is, like, do you think we'll see Overwatch add new weapons for characters that you can select that you either have to craft or, you know, earn in some way? Or do you think they'll just sort of introduce new characters that... As, as a way of kind of shaking things up over time. Because that's, I mean, that's kind of where, where these games could diverge, where you yeah. sort of go down the MOBA path and say, okay, we want to introduce new, new mechanics. How are we going to do it? Do it. We're going to introduce a dozen new characters. You know, League of Legends has more than 100, 100 characters, as does Dota 2. Or if we take the Team Fortress 2 approach and say we have nine classes, nine characters, we're going to give them a ton of stuff to customize, and they can basically change their identity completely to these yeah. like several different variants. Um, is, are either of those approaches more or less interesting to you guys? Uh, I don't know. Like personally, I don't think Blizzard knows themselves what they're going to do yet. Um, but I would like to see, I'm cu- more curious to see uh, them tackle a shooter that continually adds characters rather than weapons uh, primarily to see how that shakes out and to see if it's possible to balance that kind of thing. And I feel like, you know, you can you can embody different weapon types and balance changes in these characters. It's kind of like you can, a character can embody a, a patch almost. Um, and we've seen TF2 do the gun thing and it seems like a fun way to go about extending life of that game is, you know, crafting and introducing all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, um, so much of this game seems to be about the personality and the variety of the characters. I don't know if like the gorilla having uh, Winston, I think having you know yes. uh, uh, variable weapons like it's, he's got a shotgun or a pistol, or he's got like uh, some, you know, that's less interesting to me than the expression I feel playing as a specific character and like the attachment I have to that character. And maybe if I give a damn about the story like like Tom does, uh, I you know it, it's interesting from a lore perspective. Um, so I don't know. That's what I'd like to see. I kind of feel like um, I guess it's maybe it's just because I've played so much TF2 and so little of MOBAs, but I I just feel like the TF2 model would fit on pretty well. And like a lot of these weapons and things added to TF2, they did kind of change the characters. I mean, you could you could basically play another class. I mean, they gave the demo man a shield and a giant sword and this uh, rushing ability, and he's not really a demo man at that point. He's a, a different class, and, you know, they gave the pyro the ability to to uh, bounce projectiles back. So there are, you know, they're not new characters per se, but there were new ways to play them, which kind of stem from these new weapons and things added. And I could kind of, I don't know, there's something about a game that has just sort of a base set of, of characters without... Yeah, you know, dozens and dozens more being added that I think you can still find new ways to play just by kind of enhancing them with with new items. Definitely. 
Yeah, I think I think it's more likely that they'll add weapons. Um, I, I think there will certainly be some new characters, but I don't think it'll take the MOBA approach where we're going to see like triple the amount of characters in a couple <laughs> years or something, or new characters twice a month or something like League of Legends was doing several years ago. It's kind of crazy to think about. Um, I mean, for one thing, it's really expensive to build these huge assets, you know, these fully animated, I mean, these are really detailed, beautiful characters that they're building in Overwatch. I think the animation is one of the best parts of the game. And knowing Blizzard, they'll, they'll want to like release trailers associated with those characters and they'll want to have unique skins, just looking at something like Heroes of the Storm. So I, I think it's more likely we'll get kind of a mixture of both uh, rather than, you know, the game's roster ballooning to like 50 characters or something in a year or two. Uh, but yeah, final note on Overwatch, uh, Blizzard says that the, you know, this will be equal or larger to the largest beta wave that it's ever done. So if you didn't get into Overwatch last time, hopefully you'll get an invite, assuming you're in that program. I think you can sign up through battle.net if that sounds interesting to you. And again, I, I believe the game's releasing this spring. That's uh, crazy. I think it has an official release date yet. Cool. So XCOM 2, we've been writing about it a lot this week. Hell yeah. I've been playing it a lot since it came out. Um, have you guys been able to spend any time with it? Uh, I spent, uh, since we wanted to get a, a custom character gallery up uh, this weekend, I spent right. the first like five hours of XCOM 2 was spent in the character creator. <laughs> but I don't regret it at all. It's uh, a lot more robust than it used to be, and it was a lot of fun. You can't, you can't really get, you know, uh, nail characters down to the face, but there's a lot more expressive elements. You can tend to capture the spirit of some of the characters we created. Yeah, I think one of my favorite updates to that editor is uh, the like the attitude yes. Um, yes. selection, I guess. I think there's like five or six different sort of demeanors you can pick, and one of them is like by the book or hard luck, who like a character's animation just sort of, they start shrugging and looking really unhappy or like they've, you know, one of their best friend died or something. <laughs> um, and that matters a whole lot when, you, when you've made, I don't know, when you've made Batman or something in the game and he's like smiling <laughs> at you. It doesn't quite work. It looks kind of jarring. Um, yeah, and there's like one for, I can't think of what it's called, but it kind of makes them a little uh, paranoid or jumpy, and yeah, which I think, I think I would probably apply to every single uh, soldier I made because they're going to die really badly and <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing, so they sh they have every reason to be very worried and concerned at all times. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so, I mean, there's so much to talk about with XCOM 2, yeah. but at, at a top level, I, I think I think it's worth reiterating what, what's stated in our review, which is, and th really throughout our coverage of XCOM 2, this game improves on almost every aspect of the original, to the extent that I, I think it will make XCOM Enemy Unknown obsolete, frankly. Pretty um, much. It... it I mean, just simple improvements to the the ground game. You know, with your when you have your soldiers in the field, the way uh, you have indicators now for when you're moving into a piece of cover, will I be able to shoot this guy? That like uncertainty is basically gone. The way Overwatch works, where you not you know, if somebody activates Overwatch, an enemy activates Overwatch, not all of your guys shoot at them simultaneously, like wasting all this ammo. They shoot at them individually, and if they miss, it like activates another. Um, the reinforcement system now in game, I think, is a super fun and compelling uh, constraint on the game where you can't, I mean, very few missions are you able to just move at your own pace. Um, and I think that was honestly a flaw. I think a lot of people enjoyed that comfort. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's evident in the fact that a mod that removes mission timers is one of the first now in Steam Workshop and already one of the most popular out there. And I totally respect people wanting to play the game in their own way. But XCOM and XCOM 2 are, are about constraints and loss and making tough decisions and being forced into doing that with time as a constraint, I think is really valuable. Um, I've, I've lost people because I couldn't get them into an evac point quickly enough. I didn't manage their movement well. I didn't move quickly enough. And like, that's super frustrating. Like I was honestly pissed at myself and pissed <laughs> at the game after that happened. Um, and, and I ended up losing that campaign. I'm on my second campaign now, and it's going much better. But, um, you know, I, like one of my measurements for whether or not a game is good, and I think this is a, a broader concept. That, you know, different games are about different things. You'll get something like Just Cause 3. It's, it's about empowerment and this big, crazy action movie, Jungle Gym, basically. But just feeling something, like 
outside of my own terms is a big criteria for me about whether or not a game is good or effective. You know, uh, s s games driven by storytelling over the past few years, like The Walking Dead, I think that's a, you know, a great example. Games that put death and loss in front of you and kind of make that a theme. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't want to just ha have XCOM to my own way. I want to be thrown off guard. I want to be upset. You know, like that's part of what I'm signing up for. Yeah, and those are, I mean, those are a lot of the best stories that come out of that game. When you hear people talking about them, it's about, you know, my my squad got wiped, my my all the characters I named after my friends just died, and, like, that's the, I mean, that's, those are, within their own story, they give players the chance to tell the story of their own or, or feel something, and I think, I mean, those are the stories I like the most is hearing other people's experiences and specifics of, what happened to them and and I think you know that's a part of it in a big way too yeah uh, and we'll talk more about what we like about XCOM too but it's worth saying as well I think there's definitely it's fair to say there's been some performance issues for people or at least not the expected uh, level of optimization graphically for XCOM 2 mm -hmm. at launch this is something I've experienced for sure I, I think there's a, there's a good amount of bugs in there none of them have been game breaking for me I think the stuff I've experienced is stuff like um, just the way, so like if I'm on a roof of, of any kind and it, and it collapses, you, you fall down. I think you actually take fall damage yeah. is interesting, but like the fire behavior is kind of weird. Uh, it doesn't really convey that that's about to happen. Maybe that's not a bug, but when it does, like all the animations for that character stop working, they, they just never animate again for the rest of that whole match if they fall. Hmm. So that's super jarring. I also have an issue in some of my uh, missions now where Overwatch, and I think this is an issue dating back to XCOM. I remember it, XCOM 1, I remember it happening. Uh, Overwatch activates at like this molasses-like pace where yep. an enemy is just running in slow motion for like 10 seconds solid without anything happening. And then eventually your guy shoots at them and misses or hits. And that's like really jarring and kind of takes you out of the experience. Yeah, I've noticed that too, um, and even though I've just played a little bit, it was the first thing that jumped out. I feel like I would do things, and then there would just be this big wait, and I was like, is something happening? It just seemed like, yep. you know, several seconds <laughs> after I was done or after the the enemy was done, I was like, what happened? Why Why is everyone just sitting there? Let, <clears throat> you know, let's get a move on. It's weirdly dramatic. Last night I had, I fired a grenade, just out of my grenade launcher, like pretty long range, and like all of the trees, I was in the forest map, between me and that enemy just exploded. Like, <laughs> like 10 trees, like completely outside of the radius of this grenade. So like I was, all of my dudes were thrown out of cover. Luckily nobody died as a result of that. But I was like, I guess that grenade was just radioactive or something, I don't know. I had to create some weird fiction for, to rationale for why that happened. Maybe it was the California drought and all the trees are dry. <laughs> <laughs> it's topical, Chris. Thank you. So, and, but, you know, more broadly, I was really surprised. Um, you know, I didn't have any performance issues with the, the first XCOM. I, I think it certainly had some hitching. Uh, you know, when, when, the, when the game cuts into like a cutscene moment, so to speak, yeah. like an in-engine cutscene, I think that the frame rate would just plummet in the single digits and then, you know, pretty quickly come back. And we just kind of tolerate that. So, like, that is definitely still an XCOM 2, unfortunately. I see that whenever I start a mission. It sort of prevents me from experiencing those, those kind of introductory scenes that are pretty, like, really well animated and fun. Um, and it's worth saying, like, I love the higher level of fidelity on these characters. That really adds my ability to engage with them. And it makes it a slightly less cartoony world. Um, you know, the customization and character tool really helps there. I'm not, like... I feel like I have more variation in armor types and stuff like that, which is great. But uh, yeah, I, in general, I'm having to run the game at medium on a 980, and I'm playing. Yeah. I'm I'm playing at 1440, so there's that. Um, but I want like I have 144 hertz monitor, and I'm not able to do that with a turn-based strategy game. <laughs> like, uh, it's it's not painful. It's not like it's it's not hurting my experience, but it's it's just disappointing. Like. I thought I was going to get this like incredibly crisp, like fluid experience with XCOM on this monitor, and I'm having to run it at medium to get like 50 or the 60 frames, 
And I'm not the only one reporting this, unfortunately. No, uh, at work, uh, <laughs> my PC right now is uh, has two 980 Ti's in there uh, and an overclocked i7, 6700K. And it's just, it runs abysmally on high. And it, it, it's, it's especially bizarre given uh, this is a, a PC exclusive at the moment. And who knows exactly why these things are happening, but it's, you know, it's a huge bummer on an otherwise amazing game. Yeah. I, I shot an email to 2K on launch day to see if they had any response to this. Unfortunately, they didn't get back to us. So I think we're a bit in the dark about exactly why this is happening. I mean, certainly this game looks, you know, 50 or 75% better, if you yeah. can even quantify that, than the original XCOM in terms of detail and lighting. And like, they've really poured a lot of money. You can really see it on screen. But it, it's, it kind of sucks that the frame rate has to suffer kind of across the board seemingly for that. So hopefully some drivers are on the way or something for that. But um, in the meantime, yeah, uh, I don't know if I would I would discourage people from picking up XCOM for that reason. I like, I'm not, it, it's never, it, it never feels like there's some fundamental flaw in the game where I'm running at 20 frames or something in a critical moment. But there are kind of dips in here and there and I'm not getting, I'm not, I don't have this like high ceiling that I expected uh, where I'm running at like 80 or 100 frames. Have either of you, <clears throat> did you enable any of the day one official mods? I did. I think I enabled all of them with one exception. Um, so I've got the, one of them was the Centurion Muton, which is like a, I think a tougher variant of the Muton. Who right. Carries a rifle and grenades. He actually fucked up my campaign super hard. <laughs> the first Damn time. it. So thanks mods for killing all my dudes. Uh, I was in this, uh, I'll go through it real quick. I was in this like train level. And I, I find those like really difficult. There are a couple of these convoy levels where there's like, a bunch of cars stacked together. Sometimes they're trains, sometimes they're, they're vehicles. And um, the way cover works in there, it's it's like really awkward because you're in these like narrow sections and there's elevation, which elevation gives you like a much bigger advantage in terms of aim percentages in XCOM 2. And I, I had my guys like, I had, I had like three guys hurt. It was a longer mission. They're inside a train car in full cover. I'm like, all right, great. They're protected, they're solid. I had like one person on the outside of the car and this fucking muton centurion is like, I'm gonna throw a plasma grenade at, at you. Hell yeah. Dude on the outside of the train. He catches everybody, like insta kills two of them. <laughs> Another person panics, you know, and like runs into a terrible position. Uh, that's what it's what it's all was, about, baby. You, yeah, I mean, that's that's <laughs> XCOM. You, you've probably seen the memes floating around of like, you know, uh, just like screenshots of like, somebody's gun up an alien, a sectoid's nose, like completely shoved in their face. And it's like the yes. shock percentage is 65 or something. <laughs> it's fine. You know, I'm, I'm cool with that. I was upset, but I'm, I'm back in it. I, I won our super big mission last night. Um, so yeah, I don't know. What's, what's your guys' experience been so far? I know, I know James, you've mainly been tinkering around with that character creator, but maybe you can talk us through uh, the characters you made too. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it I'm having a lot of fun. My, I tend to play XCOM this way. I already have a pattern. Um, the first campaign I'll do is to familiarize myself with the game. And I'm already pretty familiar with it because it feels a lot like the first one. But I have all the silly characters I made for the gallery in there. Um, and uh, they, they go into a pool, which then the game randomly recruits from uh, as you play. So right now I have Bob Ross on my team. Uh, I have Gabe Newell, I have Ronda Rousey, and uh, Gene Shallot. Um, and they make a hell of a team, tell you what. And I got a couple like anonymous troopers in there too, they don't matter. Um, and it, it's, it's really interesting. I like to, uh, to see, as comical as these, these characters are, um, the fact that I put time into making them and that they already have sort of a, a, a fiction to them in you know, pop culture uh, it, it imbues them with a bit more than uh, you know your your Joe Schmo Jane Schmo recruit, and you kind of build a fun fiction around the things that happen to them. Uh, for instance, Bob Ross, in an early mission, uh, he he got shaken uh, from getting a bit too injured, and uh, he just couldn't handle the battle. <laughs> my, pretty, my pretty trees are exploding all around me. Yeah, so I've kept him. I've kept him out of battle for a bit, even though to 
remove that status effect, I uh, you got to get him into battle. I just feel bad because he's I I think he's a sweet <laughs> right. I, I just imagine the sweet painter man you, who you've changed you've changed Bob forever. James. Right, and he he like he you actually, didn't want to see what he's painting now. <laughs> Yeah, it's like I think I said <laughs> in the chat. Those trees are not happy. Those are not happy trees. You're painting you pull back in that 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 red mountain landscape with that beautiful sunset is actually like an exposed blood. alien rib cage. It's all blood. It's yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, that's that's really fun. And so my first playthrough has been a lot of that. Um, uh, oh yeah, the Trinity character from the Matrix you can uh, made Evan. She she's the most badass looking out of all of them, and has the ba most badass fiction behind most of them. First mission dead <laughs> so <laughs> i was pretty disappointed uh in that but um you know I i'm falling into the same rhythms i'm just playing around this first go around on normal uh the second time i'll go through the game once i see what the campaign has to offer because there's a bit more story and interesting things that kind of unravel as you go along I, I like to name it after people i care about all my characters about people i care about and go hardcore iron man to really just dive into the the commitments you have to make in that game and to really up the ante on the connections you have to the characters you make. Uh, because I think that's really what XCOM is all about when you get down to it. It's, it's good strategy, but it's also about making tough decisions and seeing, you know, kind of how you your personality reflects on the decisions you make um, is a really... Uh, interesting way interesting thing for a strategy game to pull out of the players uh, and you're seeing a, a lot of that and you have you saw a lot of that with the first one um and it's you know the ante is upped in this one it's, it's uh, especially with the uh better character creator so yeah you, you've got to play iron man I, i'm really glad that that's it's basically a soft default that they've introduced and when you start a campaign it's like you you kind of have to opt out of it yeah. the way it's the way it's pre presented and i think that's super appropriate yeah, I've been running with uh, the, the Trinity character that, that you mentioned that I shared with you. Um, those dark sunglasses and <laughs> pretty cool. Carrie Ann Moss's haircut. It's it's pretty accurate. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I love finding these characters that like somehow seem to fit in, in the X XCOM world. You touched on it a little bit. Um, I wrote about one yesterday. Uh, <laughs> Emily Blunt's character from uh, God. I can't even remember the title of the movie now. It's, it's escaping Edge of Tomorrow? Because they renamed the movie. Yeah, Edge of Tomorrow. There Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so her, her character's name is Rita Ver Ver Verataski, I guess. Um, so yeah, if you've seen that movie, it's a movie about <laughs> uh, Earth being sieged by aliens that have like taken over different parts of the world. And, and this is like humanity's last stand. I don't know if that sounds familiar. <laughs> if you're playing XCOM 2. And her character is like this alien god badass who's like on propaganda posters and not only that but she carries a sword which is really exciting because the ranger carries a sword in XCOM 2 and I think it's like one of the Great coolest class. additions uh, it's a really fun class to play I think along with the Grenadier mm -hmm. um, so it's got all that and in XCOM 2 there's this exosuit which is like this augmented movement suit where it's it's, it's like almost based on those modern day um, <clears throat> like stuff that we'll have in near future where um, you know, like big machinery workers are using these suits to help help them lift like really big big stuff. Um, and she's basically wearing that in the movie, and it exists in XCOM 2 as well. It looks almost identical. So you can build like a super convincing version of her. But not only that, the whole premise of the movie, which I'm not spoiling because it's all in the trailers and everything, it's couple, it's like a year and a half old at least. Great movie. Um, <laughs> the, the movie is like a Groundhog Day reality where. <laughs> <laughs> every every time Tom's Tom Cruise character dies, it like resets reality a day or whatever. So he's trapped in this like totally like uh, futile fight that they can't win against these aliens, which is like completely like th complete thematic overlap with yep. XCOM too, right? Um, so in a way, it, it also allows you to like actually. She died in my campaign last night. She got critted by this robot and super frustrating. No. And, and now I'm, it was like totally unnecessary. And I'm like, uh, I, won't, I won't go into that. I'm, I'm still disgusted with myself. Because it was, it was like a perfect mission up until that point. And an alien just like sneaks up on me. And let, you know, that's XCOM 2. Yep. Um, but again, it, it's a movie where, you know, basically every time she dies, like 
when Tom Cruise dies, that reality resumes. They get like another chance. So I'm I'm playing with like, is it canon for me to like remake her or bring her back in my campaign as another character? <laughs> um, so I think so. I think it would be. Uh, I think it's absolutely what you should do to keep in with that theme. That's good. Okay. That's all the per permission that I needed. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, other stuff. I, I think some some of the biggest changes that, that have affected my, my game play experience so far in XCOM 2 have been just the polish that they put on, the, on those kill cams. Oh, they're uh, gorgeous. I mean, I honestly thought it was a big flaw in the original... Yeah, I can't, I don't even know how to name these games anymore. XCOM Enemy Unknown, where like you would you would see certain camera uh, behaviors and you would know immediately, oh, that's a kill, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? or oh, I, I missed that, and and they vary things up in a way where that's that uncertainty is maintained throughout the experience, where like you see the camera change and you're you're sort of holding your breath, like, oh, it's like a twenty six percent shot. Oh God, I hope I nail this. Um, and they're super dramatic, and, and even though they're like repeating, you know, I've, I've been playing this for 21 hours now, which isn't a huge amount of time, but they still feel fresh and exciting. Um, the way aliens die, they feel like really excellent kind of stunt movie actors, the way they tumble and just like throw their bodies in the ground yep. and splash, and you, you hear that like kind of gooey thud on the pavement or something. That's, that's really amped up and great. And I just hate the aliens more, I feel like. I feel <laughs> like they're total jerks. Um, <laughs> But the, the metagame, too, is a super more, like, way more interesting experience, I think. Um, they, they've done away with that kind of boring, like, meaningless mechanic in the first game where you're just hitting a button that progresses time, it just fast forwards time. Yeah. Um, and in, in exchange, it's, you're, you're, as you accelerate time, you're, like, spending it to earn different resources, so you're spending it to build different stuff on the map. And, and the whole metagame basically operates as, like, a much more interesting board game, which... If you think about you know what Firaxis is good at, they build civilization, arguably the best digital board game ever made, and seeing them transition that that skill for, for building that type type of game in XCOM two, um, I think it has paid a lot of benefits. I'm with you. It's still and it, it's it's it adds to the <clears throat> <laughs> the lack of relief you get from that game. There's you can finish a mission uh, successfully, and then you go back and you realize. The Advent Project, which is kind of a world timer on a, on a, I don't know what happens when it completes, but it feels like it would be an end game scenario. You lose. You lose. Yeah, this is a game. <laughs> a game you can spend yeah. ten to fifteen hours in a campaign and lose, and that's amazing. Um, and it, like you like you said, it's a much more active experience when you're on the map, um, and I feel more torn uh, than normal. Uh, because there's all these resources you need to collect. You have to consider what kind of uh, materials you're going to build. You got to consider uh, communications arrays and like how you're going to spread your influence across the map and your reach. Um, and none of it involves, uh, like you said, just hitting a wait button. It's all committing yourself to something every turn um, and just waiting to see what happens and whether or not it pays off in the long run. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I think I agree with all that. I think my only complaint is it feels like it feels like no ground missions are truly optional. Um, yeah. It feels like it's super, like, there are these instances where it presents you with a ground mission, and I'm like, okay, I, I will get to that in a moment. However, I'm, like, one day away from completing this radar array or something that will give me this big bonus. So just hold on. So I hit ignore, and, then like, immediately it's like, no, actually, you don't want to skip this at all. Like, <laughs> you really want to do this mission, or otherwise there will be consequences. And I'm like, okay. So I feel like I've done every ground mission that has been presented to me. I don't know if I'm, I'm playing it wrong or something, but uh, that, that's a small annoyance. But yeah, in general, I, 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 I'm really falling in love with uh, the setup I and mean, just the whole plot premise for XCOM 2. Yeah. I was kind of skeptical about this at the beginning. I was like, you know, during, before the game released, I was sort of thinking, well, this whole, like, we've lost the war thing, we're the underdogs. Um, it, it's sort of one of the things I thought was, like, this much, much like, even though, like, XCOM 2 is technically, like, 20 years, I think, further in the future than the first game, it felt, like, way more sci-fi. And I was like, oh, that, like, that, I sort of want, like, a almost like a blank canvas, almost, for mods to kind of apply their stuff to. 
I don't want like all these futuristic buildings and infrastructure around. I want something that feels much more familiar. That's been completely like crossed off for me. That's not <laughs> a concern at all. I, I've really enjoyed this experience of basically being a terrorist against aliens on my own planet and f fighting a guerrilla war. I think it's a really compelling piece of lore. Um, the way that you reach out to these different parts of the world and kind of reuniting everybody and and, and finding these um, resistance groups and helping them out and protecting them. I mean, feel, it feels much more dire, right? I mean, yeah. just the fact that, it, like, if I lose Australia in XCOM 1, it's like, well, there's more continents. Like, we've got a whole planet full of people. We're <laughs> fine. Um, but if I lose Australia in, in XCOM 2, it's like, oh, shit. Like, there, there's, like, at most, like, thousands of resistance supporters, it feels like, around the globe. And, like, every life counts. It's, but, like, even when just, like, one civilian gets killed in one of those um, rescue missions, you know what yeah. I mean? Uh, it feels more significant in some way. I'm totally with you there. Uh, and, I mean, the, the story itself that they kind of communicate through how aliens are revealed and the way they connect and call back to the first game, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun to see things reintroduced, how they've changed, why they've changed. Um, and you see that reflected in their mechanics as well. Uh, I mean, an early one is, that's not really a spoiler, it's just the sectoid, how it's been, you know, genetically spliced with a human, uh, and how you can see that reflected in its design, and uh, it's a really gross, kind of unnatural looking creature that, you know, it, it it's escapes being like it was in the first game, sort of a callback to classic sci-fi alien big head, you know, and now it feels a bit more its own, a bit more twisted, monstrous. Um. Um, and that's like all of, across the board how I feel about a lot of the character design and uh, story. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Again, and, and not a spoiler, but when you're doing research um, on just the basic Advent soldiers, and it gives you this, you know, the kind of same text report, it tells you um, there's a little bit of VO over it as well. And it's like surprising to hear that underneath these like very huge masks, you know, what, what seem like human soldiers who have been like recruited somehow in the advent are actually like these human alien hybrids. And you sort of, you sort of see like their, their bone structure, it looks kind of alien and, and human at the same time. And it, it, yeah, it like really successfully conveys like, wow, these are dark beings that are kind of Borg-like in the, in the way that they're, you know, taking all the DNA that's available to them and mixing it all up to make everything better. and, and and more evil, um, so it's it's un unsettling. I think in, in a really mm -hmm. interesting way that gives you a better relationship to man. I want these guys off my planet pronto. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I'm also really glad to see that they're they're actively supporting mods this time. I think a lot of yes. companies kind of passively support mods. They're like, yeah, we love mods. We love modders. You know, you'll see Rockstar. You know, them not doing mod support there's still hundreds and hundreds of mods for their games but every time a new one comes out i'm like why, you know why not to really act you know actively support them and obviously you know it's true with the last XCOM, it didn't stop anyone there were tons of mods um but it's really nice to see them going all in and providing tools day one that's fantastic i mean fallout 4 hasn't even provided tools yet um so i think so i'm excited about that too i mean there's already uh, mods showing up. I think there's over 150 now. Um, so that'll be fun to watch um, over the next few months what people come up with. Yeah, just this week I downloaded uh, some different face paints uh, for characters that included like a really convincing Furiosa uh, <laughs> from Mad Max, of course, where she has like the forehead uh, kind of charcoal or soot. Mm -hmm. So that was really useful because I'm running that character in my campaign. Uh, so yeah, I'm predicting a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, kind of tweaks, um, like the timer stuff that I mentioned earlier, and, and there's a lot of like kind of cheap cheats and stuff like that in there in the mods right now, as well as some early cosmetics. Yeah, I think I saw a new class, uh, new character class pop up too, so that's cool. I'm I'm excited as well, especially in the long term. This is, I mean, one of the choice quotes from our review is like, it's I think it was this is a game we'll play forever. And that's not just because it's a fun game, but because uh, it's a PCSPC game. And I see 
the way they're embracing it, a couple of years from now, there's going to be some total conversions coming out. Uh, you're going to have potentially like someone <clears throat> assemble all these disparate pieces into a convincing Star Wars XCOM or S Star Trek XCOM. You yeah, could make custom voice packs, all these things, especially the way they're presented in Steam Workshop. It's pretty dang easy to use, and uh, it's really, really refreshing to see this kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm, yep. it's, it's, I mean, yeah, it's definitely got me thinking about w what have been those games that we've kind of played forever. Yeah. I think, I think Half-Life 2 is one of the biggest ones. It's one of the most modded games of all time. All you have to look at is something like Gary's Mod, which has sold millions of copies by itself um, to see the benefits that turning a game into a platform basically can have, yeah. which is increasing the longevity. I think XCOM 2 is one of the few games over the past maybe five years even that has that potential, along with Minecraft, of course. I mean, we just released, uh, uh, Chris, you just updated our uh, best Skyrim mods list, and what that came out in 2011, I think. And yeah, it's it's been years and it's still going, and there's still mods every day going out. I mean, just just looking through those for for several days to to kind of update our list, you know, you just it sometimes I just stop and I'm like, this is just incredible. There's so much stuff to do that people have made that you mean you could just play for another couple hundred hours and XCOM. Um, I mean, definitely has that potential. And, you know, it did, even the last one did because people were modding it, but now that there's support, I think you'll see more people and I think you'll see a lot more in the in the uh, in terms of, like, custom campaigns and, like you said, maybe a Star Wars version, an Aliens version, um, and that kind of stuff, so. Yeah. 32,000 people playing Skyrim right now as we speak. Jeez. Uh, what, what, was, uh, what was, like, a surprising mod call that we you would call out, Chris, that you found in that most recent update to the list? Um, for Skyrim, the ones that really kind of get me uh, excited are are these sort of um, the people who go like, yeah, that's great being the Dragonborn, but I don't want to be the Dragonborn. I want to be, <laughs> I just want to be some dude, you know. I just want to be some dude I, in. I that. That yeah, for yeah. Sure. Oh, me too. I, I mean, I love that. I love that stuff. Like, fuck the hero's journey. No thanks. Right. So there, there are so many of these sort of. Um, someone made one called alternate start, where it's like, <clears throat> okay, you're, you know, you're a prisoner in some jail or something, and then other people kept adding to them, and you can be like, you're a beggar in the street, or you came over on a ship, or you're a traveling merchant, or you live in this inn, or you're a, you know, a hunter who lives at this camp, and there's just there's just so many different ways to kind of start your game and sometimes they just have like um you know a random you can also randomize it if you're looking to kind of create a quick story it's like oh here i am in this part of the world i've got these type of belongings you know um and you can almost instantly create this little backstory about like what you're doing they have somewhere you start off as like kind of a slave in a prison camp type of thing and you have to escape and it's not like it's not a matter of just, you know, escaping in Skyrim where you just pull a lockpick out of your butt and pick a lock. It's like <laughs> you actually have to work hard to escape. Um, that stuff gets me excited because it, in that way, you really are creating, you know, a whole different game. You know, there's there's still going to be those Skyrim quests out there. Um, but it does create a, a brand new experience. And, you know, a lot of times when you've been through these big RPGs a few times, you, you enjoy the world so much and it's like, but do I really want to go, do I really want to be the same guy again or yeah. the same, have the same sort of adventure? And this is a, those are just great ways to just completely s sort of start over with a whole different mindset and kind of create your own story. So those are the ones that, they really get me excited. Great. Cool. Uh, so yeah, before we answer your questions on Twitch, if you're watching on Twitch, start to feed us your questions into the chat and we'll get to them a little, in a little bit. Uh, we want to mention also Firewatch, not Overwatch, but Firewatch, <laughs> um, which released just this week. Our reviews up on PC Gamer, we gave it a 85 and a lot of good praise for that game from Campo Santo. So if you haven't heard of Firewatch, it's a, I guess, first person exploration game. Set in Wyoming, the Wyoming wilderness, I think in the it's either the 80s or the very early 90s. 
uh, and you're a watchman in a fire watch in, in a national park. And you basically have like one person that you're interacting with over the radio. Um, yeah, James, you said you finished it. Yes. Last night. And, uh, you know, of course, this isn't something we want to spoil, so don't worry about that. <laughs> but uh, generally speaking, how, how did it find you? What was surprising about it? Um, and what, what did you think of the world? I, I think it's a really compelling setting myself. Uh, the world is probably the most standout thing to me. I mean, uh, the story itself is, is, is well done, and it's told in an interesting way. I mean, it's coming from a lot of uh, expats from Telltale who worked on uh, season one of The Walking Dead, which is respected for its, its compelling story and emotional story. Um, but... Uh, it, it was especially interesting to me, Firewatch, because it takes place, like you said, in Wyoming, Shoshone uh, uh, Woods, and uh, I, I grew up pretty close to that area. I spent a lot of time actually down. Um, it's, it's kind of adjacent to Yellowstone National Park, Teton National Park, if you guys, any of you out there are national park fiends. Um, and it's absolutely gorgeous. I think it's one of the first games that I can, besides I think The Witcher did a good job too, that captured what forested areas look like and feel like. Um, the isolation, the way uh, coolies form, rivers and creeks, the way they you know uh, naturally kind of part uh, through mountains, um, rock formations, the spirit of it is all there. And it's especially well done with the, the color theory here is just off the charts there's there's uh you start off kind of um seeing this in the day and it's bright it's uh livid it's uh there are, you know a, a lot of good ambient sounds uh the creek washing in the distance and uh some birds and, and so on so i mean nature lovers if you just want to walk around a cool place it's 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 uh beautiful for beautiful for that um as far as the gameplay itself, it's uh, fairly linear, where you're mostly chatting with uh, your boss, basically via uh, some some walkie talkies, and you kind of get to know each other over the course of the, your summer there. Uh, mysterious things happen, uh, and an adventure unfolds. Uh, a lot of it has to do, I think, with isolation um, and what being alone can do to us and why we try not to be alone <laughs> if I'm being vague enough but uh, yeah um, as far as what's in the world I mean that's the thing is it's an, a linear narrative game it, you can kind of go off and explore certain pockets of the woods uh, but you're definitely being funneled at least in a design sense, around these semi-open areas. Uh, and they're a lot of fun to explore, but there's always a sense of urgency, uh, typically a sense of urgency, so uh, exploring isn't really the point. Um, uh, I don't know, Chris, you've played a little bit of it yourself. What are you thinking so far? Yeah, um, <clears throat> two things. One, I was a little, I guess, apprehensive but from watching some of the... The trailers, it looked like you spend a lot of time talking to someone yeah. uh, over radio, which is, I guess, probably my least favorite thing in games. And I thought, <laughs> oh, I'm not going to like this. <clears throat> you know, it looked like every time you found an object, <clears throat> excuse me, you had to have a conversation about it. And I just thought, well, that's not going to be fun. Um, but A, you don't. I mean, you don't have to call the uh, pick up the radio and call every time. And B, like, I am absolutely picking up the radio and calling every time because I'm really enjoying the the beginning of this sort of relationship with the person on the other end of the radio i think the the dialogue is really well written <clears throat> i immediately liked um unfortunately i can't think of his name he was in mad men who voices the who voices your character i thought immediately he was doing a great job Very good yeah um <clears throat> as was the person on the other end and immediately that became my thing it was like what what else is around here that i can talk to someone about because i'm really enjoying the beginning of this relationship. Um, so that was fun. I'm, I'm always happy to be surprised at something that I thought, oh, I'm not going to like this. I'm like, oh, this is my favorite part. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the world, it's definitely beautiful. Uh, I really don't like moving around in it. Um, yeah. <laughs> at all. I feel, 
I feel, you know, I mean, I don't expect him to be sprinting, but I do feel very slow and sluggish. And, you know, this isn't this isn't like an open world game, like you said, yeah. in any way. It's there's invisible walls everywhere. It's it reminds me a bit of of walking around the witness and feeling like, well, I can I can just step up onto that little incline where there's a rock and no you can't and there's very few places to really feel like you're exploring um which is fine it's not you know it's not a an open world game it's an adventure game and you do need to go through these you do need to follow the path um but it, it you know it's certainly very very uh enjoyable to to look at i think the sound design is is very good the music is good though i feel i don't know it, it doesn't seem to quite it just seems to start very abruptly. Um, yeah, I think it, which I don't know how else music can start <laughs> except abruptly, but it doesn't seem to uh, fit in as as well as some games make it fit in. It, it just feels a bit too busy. like old. Yeah, it's it's less ambient. I mean, it it pops in when you're in these long stretches because there are long stretches where you just be walking and be alone. Right. Um, and the music will pop in, and it's like some sitting on my front porch guitar casual thing you know and it's like eh, a little tonally overreaching but um you know it's never like a deal breaker no it's just something i thought oh okay yeah, there's music yeah, like yeah. um but i'm i'm interested in seeing uh seeing what happens and where it goes and um yeah so i'm in, i'm enjoying it great any thoughts on the firewatch multiplayer <laughs> uh you know uh definitely the hit boxes are, are way off Oh God! Yeah, I threw this. <laughs> Personally, I feel like fire is really overpowered right now in the game, and um, <laughs> watching is kind of underpowered. They need to buff watching, it. like in order for the meta to evolve in an interesting way. Oh, God, that's it's really frustrating to be playing with a random in co-op, and they don't have a mic, so you're just <laughs> hello, hello, <laughs> hello. What do you nothing, think of this nothing. book? Oh man, good one, Chris. Uh, someone asked, yeah, what do you guys think of Firewatch? And this is the last casuals asking. What do you guys think of Firewatch as the number one game on Twitch right now? I feel like watching someone play Firewatch is like watching somebody read a novel. Um, yeah. It seems completely pointless to me. I mean, it's, it's I think, about around a five-hour game and just the type of experience it is. I mean, I, I totally understand people using Twitch as a way to get a sense of whether they want to buy something, but I'm so protective of, you know, I, I'm exposed to gaming information all day long, basically, yeah. and I'm like, really protective of spoilers around certain games, but especially like narrative driven uh, single player games. Yeah. And in so. Firewatch, it, it begins with this really like powerful text segment where you're making choices that, you know, yeah. sets up the motive for the rest of the game and your relationship with Delilah and everyone. And to not do that yourself is to, like, I think, rob yourself <laughs> of something that could be really special. Yeah. I, I, I just think I don't see how the experience gets better by watching somebody. Yeah. What you, what you gain from that, yeah. I think, you know, I think probably a lot of people would are, are, are not watching it because they're interested in Firewatch. I think they're probably interested in the person that they watch every day stream games sure. and say, oh, how is, what is this guy playing? <clears throat> but, yeah, I, I agree. I think, uh, yeah, it is, that is kind of a, a strange one, I think, to, to be like, I'm interested in this game. I'm going to watch someone play it through in its entirety. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. A commenter comment on the talking game seems like the worst, like PewDiePie <laughs> talking over an emotional conversation. Seems a little bit, you know, redundant, but. Cool. Yeah. Uh, some other questions here as we wrap up this week's show. Glass Casuals also asked, expectations of the Division open beta. So this is something that Chris and I got to play, uh, I think the weekend before last, we were poking around in that Division beta. Yeah. And I, it I guess grew I, on me, I gotta say, like, I, I went to a preview event and I wasn't really that into it. And then I started playing the beta with uh, some of the PC gamer guys and I wasn't that into it. And then uh, I think I played it like Saturday night and then Sunday night and then it extended to Monday. <clears throat> and I was like, hmm, I kind of want to play Monday. I kind of want to play Monday night. <laughs> and then it was over and, and I was like, oh, I can't play anymore. Like, And I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was really loving it in any way, but it was... I was sort of enjoying something about it. I can't really put my finger on it. I think, I think I was maybe getting comfortable with how everything worked, and um, you know, I don't play a lot of multiplayer, and I think a big part of it was just playing with all you guys was a lot of fun. Um, yeah. But I also, I think there's a decent single player uh, 
experience in there somewhere because like running around with you guys was fun but there was no tension i didn't feel any danger i didn't really wasn't really soaking in the world or anything but playing by myself i think i was a bit more cautious um you know there were some kind of kind of spooky and well-designed underground areas that i was kind of fun to go down by myself because i didn't have any idea what was down there so there were things about it that i kind of enjoyed yeah i haven't really had this experience since i was playing dc universe online in uh, probably 2011 or something uh, i don't play mmos but um <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it, it was fun to run around with you guys. It, it's tough for me because I, I, I experience that tension in games like Diablo when I'm playing with friends, where it just becomes this this race. Even though it's a game where the loot is not uh, up for grabs, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not like a jump ball on, on these knee pads or whatever. It's it's exclusive to my character. I just feel like this tension between movement and navigation and, and like managing a group of people like I'm escorting a bunch of preschoolers around not that, not that you guys Ouch. With, with guns not Oof. that you guys are preschoolers but like because you're, you're like really easy to play with and like we stick together and stuff but it's just sort of like I don't know it's like, it's like the FPS part of my my brain that's like managing space and movement and like positioning and stuff like that but it, it becomes this tension where I'm, I'm completely focused on navigation and the UI and getting from A to B and, I can't, and I'm just not playing at my own pace and not enjoying it in that regard, I don't know. I also think the shooting's super boring, but shooting's pretty bad. That's, that's true. Of, that's true of almost every third-person shooter. I mean, I, Ubisoft's like and, and massive. The developer is like really super adamant, and they've been saying this throughout the beginning that like we were talking about this this week, I guess. That you know, we've been calling an RPG from the beginning. It's an RPG first, first yeah. and foremost. It's yeah. not. A, it's not a shooter. It's not a shooter. It's not a shooter. Well, your game has a bunch of guns, and I'm sorry, and it has a cover system. Yeah. And shooting is kind of what you do 90% of the time in order to get stuff, in order to progress. So you can call it an RPG all you want. Um, you know, the character building isn't even that really that deep and significant. I mean, I guess I want to caveat what I'm saying with the beta seemed like it was leaving out like 60 or 70% of the game, you, even just in that opening area. Like, you get basically a story mission and a half. Um, like, all the crafting and, and stuff like that is cut out completely and there's all these kind of elements of your base you can't even get a sense of what they do <clears throat> so yeah you know if it turns you know if it, if it gets well reviewed and you guys are playing it a bunch and it turns out to be a cool thing maybe i'll jump back in there but i'm not really planning on it right now yeah though i mean there's uh, you know loot it, it's hard to say you know how much they left out but i mean the loot was really underwhelming the Guns I, were underwhelming. There was nothing to really give us give a real sense of like what's gonna make me kind of keep coming back. So we'll have to see. Sorry, this dog is very <laughs> attention starved. It's pretty. Oh, it's fun. I understand. <laughs> I'm talking about games, not about dogs, for the past hour. <laughs> Other questions that we've got here. Uh, I can't pronounce people with numbers in their name, but SP3 Rabbis, uh is sort of like Spartacus, but with a three in it. Um, <laughs> asked about the second part of the Pillars of Eternity expansion. I know we're going to have some content on this pretty soon on the website. Looking yep. forward to hearing what our folks in the UK have to say about that. Um, definitely one of our favorite RPGs over the past several years. But at this time, yeah, I don't think we've we spent any time with it or have anything to say. Nope. Nope. No. Uh, what else, guys? Looking for more questions here. In the meantime, uh, James, what's your what's your worst XCOM two character that you made so far that is not Gene Shalit? Like, you mean worst as in just oh my gosh, I got Gene Shalit. Uh, I have Jubilee from X Men. She's she's a Jubilee sniper from X Men. She's uh, like all like yellow, bright yellow, <laughs> and magenta. Uh, I made a notch I'm pretty proud of, but he also has a really stupid top hat. Um, uh, he's patterned with the like digital camo to look like Minecraft blocks with brown and green, and I was very happy with that. But uh, I made uh, Jon Snow from Game of Thrones, but 
it, it was a, a terrible choice because he just dresses all in black all the time and he just looks unhappy. <laughs> so it, was, it took about three seconds. I just had to slap a beard on and, and nice. change, change all the armor color oh, yeah. to black. Every, I can't believe I missed this, but this is the b biggest missed opportunity apparently is every time we've posted uh, pictures of the Kylo Ren character I made, the top comment is, this looks like server is Snape. <laughs> <laughs> not Kylo Ren. And I'm sorry, I'm not a Harry Potter guy. I thought it was, I thought it was a pretty convincing Kylo Ren. Thank you. You got the sword, you got the red weapon. He's all like in black with a kind of a cloak almost. Uh, I thought it was great. Thank you. Yeah, I thought the notch the notch one was good too. I know the hat was way too big, but you did give it that kind of blocky uh, skin on it. So I thought, hey, that was pretty 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 good pull. My art. I thought that was clever. Thank I you. have a really convincing Wolverine because eventually you unlock uh, cigars. Hell yeah! And, uh, he's he's got that like crazy guile haircut. You know the <laughs> yeah. It's it's literally guile. Yeah. <laughs> there was like a, there was a cross promotion <laughs> that they ran for the original XCOM to add that haircut. Um, yeah, really good. Um, so somebody asked, I can't find it now, but they're asking what our favorite shooter was and why. Without turning this into a 20-minute discussion about Counter-Strike, uh, I'll try to be super succinct and say that, um, yeah, Counter-Strike's my favorite shooter of all time. It's like an unspeakably high skill ceiling game that remains in interesting and balanced. I think it's a great evidence for this, this thought I have about FPS maps in that, like, I think F, FPS maps, like, contain traditions. And you think about a map like Dust 2 and the behaviors that people have on those maps where, like, at the start of a Counter-Strike round, you know, those double doors, they were like, you know, everybody remembers those, those double doors down the middle of Dust 2. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the way people, like, jump in order to avoid getting sniped at the gap <laughs> there, that's like, that's like a tradition in and of itself. And then there's all these traditions associated with it, like the way we throw smoke, uh, the way like <clears throat> we stack snipers down the middle and on, on the terrorist side. And I think like it's really special in that way. It's it's just particularly true in Counter Strike the way that each map kind of is a tra tradition of FPS competitive play, and it, it evolves slightly over time. But it's it's unique to that map. Our behaviors and our our rhythm almost, and acting that out over time is like a really cool shared experience. Um, yeah, Rainbow Six is like the shooter I'm playing most right now. I think it's super fun. It's not so demanding in terms of motor skills, uh, which is great, but it, but it still like uses a lot of brain power. You get to be really clever and, and outsmart people and do like really good scouting and, and positioning and stuff like that and lurking as it's known. Where like it's really satisfying to lurk in Rainbow Six where you have like you or one of your teammates plays off the objective and then they play in like an unexpected obscure spot and then your, your effectiveness is all about like timing and sneaking up on people. So you almost get to be like this rogue within uh, like a very shooty FPS, which is pretty fun. Heck yeah. Uh, I'll keep my answer shorter because I'm not much of a hardcore shooter guy. Uh, in terms of design of shooting, uh, I'd probably say I love to, I still love going back to all the Doom games and uh, it just, it's unadulterated move quickly, dodge these giant fireballs, uh, you know, manage the enemies on screen, um, mixed in with some, you know, uh, labyrinth navigation and intrigue in that way, and uh, I never really get sick of it, so that's kind of why I'm looking forward to the next Doom, actually, the new Doom, so. Um, I would probably, I guess it's probably more about the world, but um, Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl, still, still a game that I can't even say the words out loud without wanting to be like, maybe I should play Stalker tonight. <laughs> um, it's a game that, uh, you know, obviously open world, which I love. I love having uh, the choice to kind of go where you want to go. Um, but it, it really no game I find has a sense of kind of dread like that game. Like the darkest, deepest, scariest basement isn't as scary as being out in the sun in a field where you can see everything around you because there's just there's this dread just interwoven because you never uh, you never become some kind of superhero you never become like this massive killing machine at any point you know you'll get a bad break and and someone will get the drop on you and 
you'll be dead and it'll you'll be shot and it'll be over and i think i've I've always really loved that about it that um you know while you do get cool gear and you you upgrade your armor and stuff you still just feel like anyone else any other you know npc stalker in the game um yeah so that's that's still one of my favorites stalker is an extraordinarily russian game i say that with with total affection and the knowledge that it's developed by a ukrainian team i think um but it's so willing to throw you in just like a disorienting environment and just explain nothing like if stalker was developed by like any western developer it would just be piles of tutorials and piles of like (laughs) introductory encounters where you encounter the lower lowest level enemy and then like you're able to be empowered by defeating them in like a really like simple circumstance. It's just like, no, I'm going to throw the weirdest anomalies and and shit at you and just figure it out. Like figure out how it works. Like it's not even going to send you like these big sort of um, signals of like, I'm an enemy. Here are my mechanics. I am weak against water or like grenades or something. Orienting shit. Like mankind has fucked up this world. Okay, and that's gonna like break down and you good luck. Um, really terrific modelable game. Yeah. Uh, some, yeah. some great enhancements you can make to that experience. Definitely yeah. worth coming back to. And I think it's also worth call, worth calling out. I um it's it really straddles the line between being kind of arcadian and mirroring a little more, I don't know, a little less arcadian than that. You know, I think that does it for us this week, guys. James and Chris, thanks for joining me to talk about XCOM and everything else. I'm sure we'll be back talking more XCOM and other games next week. It's a pretty exciting year for PC gaming so far. Really really good stuff happening so far. We've we've been pretty busy in the office. So on that note, let's get back at it. Um, If you're listening on iTunes, thanks. Feel free to leave us a review on there. It helps us out a lot. Um, otherwise, we are back on Twitch at 1 o'clock Pacific every Tuesday, twitch.tv slash PCGamer. Thanks for watching, guys, and we'll see you on the website on our usual. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye.